and welcome to our worship service for March 7, 2021. My name is Bill Grace, the minister here at St. Luke's Presbyterian Church, Oshawa, and we welcome you here that you're able to join us for this time of worship that we set aside. And uh, as far as announcements go, if you're here this time next week, you might be an hour late. So between now and the end of the week, we are going to spring forward in time. There's one friendly reminder. There is a youth group meeting this afternoon at 3.30 online via Zoom. If you are interested in joining, it's still not too late. You can track us down, send a message. We can provide you with the links. Our youth leader, Tyler, uh, will be there pretty much for children, say, between ages of 7 and 12, where there will be online games to play, uh, you name it, and also ending with uh, time of, of uh, Bible story and devotional. And it runs roughly from 3.30 to 4.30, this afternoon for the youth, and it's not too late to join, let us know. Also, it's also not too late to be part of the road trip to truth. We are now heading into the session five uh, this Thursday evening at seven, and that is also online. Um, let us know if you're interested, we can send you the information for that as well. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship as we enter into our time of worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. With the whole firmament, let us proclaim God's handiwork. The law of the Lord receives the, the soul. May God's teaching bring us wisdom in our worship. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. For you are a rock and redeemer, and so we praise you. Almighty God, we give you thanks that by finding a time of quiet, that just taking a moment from everything else the day demands from us, we turn to you to know that we have that connection. To know as the world continues to confuse us, trouble us, we have peace with you. We see a world that has such beauty in it. We'll see an uptick in temperature. We'll see the snow melt away. We'll see mud come back. And all throughout, we know it's all going to your plan. Things we won't understand, things we still think we comprehend but don't. We see signs of it all through your creation. 
We thank you, Lord, for these provisions that we have. To also know that in your plan, you take us and breathe life into us. That you've pulled us away from our sin. And that you still continue to redeem and renew and restore. Assures the promises of spring. You lead your sheep to your pasture. We thank you, Lord. We, we don't do things to deserve it. We continue to do things that are against your will. There's things we say, things we do, the way we react. Things that go on in our mind the way we withhold our actions, how we act indifferent to terrible things that happen around us. Not one thing goes by that you don't notice, that you will not call us to an account for. So we give you thanks. That each sin has been attributed to the count of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray the words that he taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning we are going to read to you the responsive reading taken from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warm, warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen to the sharing of his word. Once 
First reading of scripture this morning is from Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17, the Ten Commandments. And God spoke to all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below, or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, nor worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter or your manservant or maidservant, 
nor your animals, nor your, the alien within your gates. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The second reading this morning is from the first Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 to 25. Christ, the wisdom and power of God. For the message of the cross is foolish, foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But through those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The third reading this morning is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Jesus clears the temple. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple, and both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get out, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. On this third Sunday in Lent, I find myself wondering, am I doing Lent as I ought to be? Some people look at Lent as a time of spiritual discipline, time of refocusing, maybe by adding or subtracting things to their day-to-day -day lives. Lent is a time of preparation and consideration, ultimately to be focusing on the suffering of Christ as we get closer to Easter. So then I wonder, are Lent sermons meant to be any different than other sermons? Because we read a passage today in 1 Corinthians that, that has resounded with me and has been a pillar, a guide, a rock in my ministry as short as it has been so far. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23 but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, 
Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It's been a little over two years with the, this congregation here at St. Luke's and also at St. James, and a little bit of itinerant preaching as a student minister, a couple of years leading to that. And I should say that it has been my goal that I've now developed to preach the same sermon every week. Yes, perhaps it will change just a bit, that it might sound a bit different, but I have only one proclamation, and that is to preach Christ crucified. Jackie, our wonderful music director, has gotten a little tired of asking me the question of what I will be preaching on a particular Sunday because she wants to try and pair the music with the message. And she's gotten used to my regular answer, used to it, but probably not happy with it. I'm preaching about Jesus on Sunday. Then perhaps, after she rolls her eyes, I will tell her what the particular passage is on. Maybe it's about walking on water, the miracles of healing, feeding the multitudes. Maybe it's one of the letters of Paul and how Paul is expressing how to show the love of Christ to one another. Maybe it's from the Old Testament. But every time, it is about Jesus. And not that he is good or wise a great teacher, that he's kind, or that he's a good example. All those things are true, but we preach one thing, that he is Lord. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And from that, knowing that that he's just not someone who's good or impressive, but knowing that God came to us, that we are left with one overarching purpose, to acknowledge the great exchange. Our sin for his righteousness. Old Testament, New Testament, it all points to Christ and his saving power. Not simply do we preach the acts of Jesus or the sayings of Jesus. Specifically, we preach Christ crucified. If I am standing behind a pulpit, I have a duty to say things Things that are so hurtful to the outside world that instead of seeing it for what it is, they'll instead call it foolishness and laugh it off. Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is foolishness to the unbeliever. And perhaps, in some small part, we should be thankful for that. Why the outside world doesn't just shut us down, I don't know. Perhaps we just seem harmless. That we've created enough churches and orphanages and showed how loving we are. But our message is devastating. Everyone. Everyone will be in one of two categories. There is no third option. Perishing in your sins or saved by Christ. And the difference between the two is in the message of the cross. The message of the cross, the message of crucifixion, the redemption of sinners requires the death of the Son of God. That's perhaps the next barrier of foolishness. To concede not only do we sin, or that there is sin in the world, there is such a thing as, as sinning against the God who created you, but we sin enough 
that God would condemn us and that we would need saving from it outside of ourselves. It's not something we just fix and make up for a scale, a balance to do enough good to undo the wrong. That has been the story the entire time. Telegraphed to us through the Old Testament, the death and resurrection of Jesus, it took place during the Jewish Passover. Passover commemorated Egypt and Israel and their struggle when they were held captive and being held as slaves by Pharaoh. And the Passover marks the final judgment on Egypt when Pharaoh would not release the Israelites. The firstborn son of every household would die, of every household, free or slave, Jew or Egyptian, except if the lamb was sacrificed and the blood of the lamb was painted onto the doorway of the house, the judgment would pass over that house that was covered by the blood of that lamb. Foolishness for those who reject that God can be loving and also have wrath. For our living does not stop at the grave. Every person who ever lived will be called up, will be resurrected, and brought before the judge. And an eternity will await. And what will await you? The hell that you deserve? A just reward for sin and rebellion? Or an eternity that you do not deserve of heaven? Purchased for you with blood, the Lamb of God covering you with his blood given to you by grace. I have not the slightest inclination to stand behind a pulpit and preach to you about how to be a better person or a better parent or how to handle your finances or or on the coronavirus or on racism or how to have a better marriage or health advice, especially not on how to raise your children because I can assure you I am no expert on that. No. I will preach Christ crucified. And by doing so, I expect many of those other things to come into perspective and and to fall in line. But it is foolishness to the perishing unbeliever. To know more about that, let's go back to verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. For since... In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. God in his wisdom, which I cannot stress enough, is far beyond our wisdom. God did not create us to acquire the answer to our sin debt by employing our own wisdom, like a riddle to solve, or a skill-testing question. It is not philosophical. It's not scientific. It's not requiring long division or higher mathematics. And I like wisdom. I like knowing things. I love knowing things in the field of what they call Christian apologetics which does use philosophy, reasoning, historical data to defend and strengthen Christianity for those who have doubts. I love that. But having that knowledge will not save. Witnessing miracles 
will not save. We have that in our scriptures. If salvation had anything to do with your abilities or your brain power, then there'd be room for boasting. Faith in Christ. Believing in the message of the cross is how you are saved. God is just. And he will reward injustice with wrath. God will punish sin. But he will also show incalculable mercy. Mercy on those who are protected by the blood of Christ. Like the Passover. For the foolish message of the cross is that the wrath that was set for you has already been settled. There is no day of reckoning to come. So, am I doing Lent wrong? I could be. But on this third Sunday of Lent, and the next two to come, and then Palm Sunday afterwards, and then Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, if you want to know what will be preached then, and then for the weeks following, it will be Christ crucified. For it is the power of God. If you still haven't placed your faith in the message of the cross, now is the time. By faith, you exchange every one of your sins for the righteousness of Christ. It is not foolishness. It is the power of God. Amen. And to God be the glory. Let us pray. Gracious God, we continue to give you thanks in all seasons, in all times. But in those times where hurt builds up, where pain is abundant. We come to you in prayer as you call us to. We pray, Lord, for healing as it's sorely needed. For those dealing with medical conditions. For those dealing with infections under a doctor's care. Preparing for types of procedures. I pray for healing to come. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling, perhaps financially, trying to provide. We ask for provision. For those dealing with Emotional grief, emotional trauma, fear and anxiety. We pray for your peace. For those struggling with temptation and addiction, we pray for your strength. For those struggling with loneliness, still not able to make connections that are worthwhile. We pray for your presence. Lord, we pray for the, the rulers and the government that we have making the decisions right now of how the vaccine will be distributed and rolled out. May it be done properly. May it be done in in the right ways, Lord. May you continue to establish us and prepare us for our own trials. Allow us to be strengthened through trials and controversy. Allow us to lean on you and not on our own understanding when the world challenges us and we see no rest. 
that we continue to find our rest in you. We pray, Lord, that you open our eyes, that there are opportunities for us to show love, to show compassion, and that you will set us out to be the answer to others' prayers. That we will continue with your church and your kingdom. For all these blessings that are around us, Lord, may we continue to be bound to your service and your call. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
now may the very God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.